Turn with me to the book of Psalm 44, from the first verse to verse number 3. Psalm 44, from verse 1. We have heard with our ears, O God, our fathers have told us what work thou didst in their days and in the times of the old how thou didst drive out the heathen with thy hand and plantest them how thou didst afflict the people and cast them out for they got not the land in possession by their own sword I wanted to underline that one. For they got not the land in possession by their own sword. Neither did their own arm serve them, but thy right hand and thine arm and the light of thy countenance, because thou hadest a favor unto them now i wanted to go to another similar scripture in the book of deuteronomy chapter number eight and verse 17. you will notice that though those scriptures are very different separate from each other and yet they talk about the same thing. And thou say in thine heart, my power and the mighty of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. Okay. Tonight we are going ahead and uh, continue talking about provision faith. And this is why I think we are taking too long talking about the same kind of faith because it also covers a lot of aspects because provision is not just in terms of money provision whatever you that you would want God to provide whether it is healing whether it is peace whether it is long life whether it is health that is provision that's why we have to take that long dealing with that kind of faith provision faith but now tonight we are presented with a case here which if we are not really careful in the few years to come it will be a very difficult subject because looking at the generations that are coming now it's going to be very hard and very difficult to convince them that God can supply and bless an individual without that particular individual having to labor for it. So we are breeding a generation that is uh, so determined to fight their own battles and to do everything that it takes to make money whether God likes it or not. So now I'm going to talk to you from the book of Psalm 44. The writer here is talking about words that were spoken and that were passed from one generation to the next generation and is sort of like narrating what happened during the old times and it was given to him uh, as history and is now writing about the acts of God and how God delivered his forefathers and how God fought the battles for them and he's saying we had all of it and we were told and 
it is so amazing how you delivered the land from the hands of the heathens and you planted your own people into that same place we heard about it we were not part of the process we were not present but it came to us in form of news these are your mighty works oh god this is what you did during their time you planted your people in the land and then in verse number three they also explained to us that what made it possible for them to possess the land it was not because of their own sword or because of their own ability but it was your hand and the light of your countenance that was shining upon them it was you god who gave them favor but if you look at it also you notice that really it appears as if they fought some wars and they did something to drive out the heathens from the promised land but how come then they sort of like are, they are passing on wrong information to the next generation as if they never fought is it really because they are lying to the their uh, uh, grandchildren or it could be a realization that after they had gotten victory they all sat down they analyzed their strategy they looked at the ammunition that they had and they came to one conclusion and they said wars can never be won by such a strategy we never exerted a lot of energy though we fought though we played our role in driving out the canaanites and the jebusites but if we are to be honest with ourselves we can't say we fought any war because the way we fought it and the way we got the victory it was too easy we can't say it was as a result of the strategy that we applied but all of us we can agree on one thing that god was involved and it was god himself who was fighting on our behalf so they wrote a letter or they passed on the same information to the next generation not encouraging them to stop fighting but trying to remind them that in as much as you fight there has to be god involved so that you don't do the rest of the fighting alone i want you to understand that because in life if you don't understand you can fight battles and you can be trying to get something for the rest of your life and that's something you might not even be able to get it not because you lack faith you might have all the faith but most people they lack this understanding that god unless he gets involved in your attempts in your pursuits okay in your plans unless god comes in and helps you to fight you are no, never going to win even a single battle so what they did was to fight of course physically and try they tried there by all means to drive out the heathens but finally when they got the victory and now they were now in possession of the land they say to themselves guys can we really say that we fought is this how battles are fought no and they came to one conclusion they said no it was the lord himself who fought for us and who gave us this land to possess it's not because of our own sword or the strength of our own arm but it was the countenance of the lord that was shining upon us are you following so it's something that i want you to understand 
it is the lord who fights for his people you come to such a place in your life where you you look at what you have in terms of possessions right and then we are going to interview and ask you questions like so how did you get this one and most of those things you are never going to be in a position where you'll be able to explain really how you got it but you have it now in possession but how you got it you realize that there is an amount of grace that comes upon an individual when god looks upon you and his face is shining upon you it was the lord who favored them the same scripture in the book of deuteronomy lest you deceive yourselves and you say in your heart my own strength and my own power has gotten me this wealth it's a test of prosperity that falls upon every individual who gets successful in life there is a moment in time when your heart is deceived and you begin to think about the efforts that you have put okay the energy that you have applied the books that you have read the advices that you have got from different places and different authors and other prosperous people and you might conclude that it was because of your efforts so in this verse the writer is saying don't be deceived and end up thinking in your heart that the reason why you are that prosperous it was because of your mighty and your power no and then he jumps to the next verse now and he said for it is the lord himself who gives you power to get that money and to get that wealth are we together so what i'm talking about now is that ability that grace that comes upon you as a disciple from god that helps you to acquire and to even accumulate without you having to put a lot of effort I didn't say you are not going to be doing anything like Israel. They fought against the Jebusites. But I'm saying after the fight, they said, we didn't do enough to deserve the victory. There should be something behind the little effort that we've put. So I'm talking about you now from this place doing little things, putting just a little bit of effort. And then the rest, you're wondering, how is this possible? It is because of the face of God that is going to be shining upon you. You see, and once you start having the grace of God upon you and hovering upon you, you do little and realize much. Now, I'm just trying to encourage that faith and bring that faith into existence and to make you believe that surely God can do anything with the power that he has not necessarily having to look at the amount of power that you have yourself he can do that there are people i, I would just want to give you a, a scripture that we read last time but about the same character from the book of romans chapter number four look at verse number 18 talking about Abraham okay let's read it together want to go Abraham against hope he believed in hope uh-huh you see he's believing okay against hope he's believing in hope that he might become the father of many nations for abraham to become a father to all of the nations that we now have it was all because he believed and his belief if you look at it it was against all the hope for him to become a father of many nations he believed against all hope and according to that which was spoken so shall thy seed be 
Okay, according to what? To that which was spoken. So faith, we can come up with different definitions. But faith is simply acting upon the word of God. If you can act upon the word of God and taking God at his word, that is faith. What made Abraham to believe that he was going to become the father of many nations? It was because of what was spoken. So shall thy seed be. So before Abraham could become a father to many nations, what God did was to speak a word upon his life. And Abraham believed upon not the manifestation, but the word that was spoken. And he believed. Though the word was against all hope. It's a very nice word. Very interesting word. A promising word. But it's coming during a time when there is no hope anymore. But still he believed. He looked at his hopelessness and he looked at the power of the spoken word and he said i would rather believe the word that is spoken by god he believed and look at that and god even called him abraham from abraham abraham meaning the father of many and he was now being called by that name before he became a father to many nations what came before sons and daughters it was a name a spoken word you shall be called you are called abraham abraham father of many nations father of many nations father of many nations and during that time when they were calling him abraham abraham he didn't even have a child it was just a name that he got from god okay let's continue let's continue And being not what? Weak in what? Aha. And being not weak in faith. So you can have faith. And if your faith is not strong, it is weak. Okay? As long as you have faith and your faith is not strong, it means your faith is what? Weak. And having weak faith doesn't mean that you don't have faith. You have faith, but your faith is weak. If your faith is weak, it means it cannot carry the Lord. It cannot push the expectation. There's no strength. It is there. It's just like a child who is lying there on the floor. He can't even lift up himself. You can't say the child is not there. The child is there. The baby is there lying on the floor. But you cannot assign that particular child and to give that baby an assignment just because he's present he's never going to perform just because he's present there comes a time when he gets strong and then you can give him some assignments and say before i come back i want to see you doing this and then he can do that not just because he's present but because he's now strong and powerful to perform so faith you don't just have to have it you have to mature it you have to develop it it has to become strong not being weak in faith every child of god has an amount of faith but the reason why it cannot perform for all of you it is because of the weakness and the strength that that faith might have if your faith is not strong enough it is not going to be able to go out there and bring back anything because it cannot do that for you because it is called weak faith and being not weak in faith which means it was, it was very very strong in faith though he was weak physically never allow your faith to become weak even though your body might be weak okay but your faith should always remain strong and being not weak in faith he considered not his own body now dead you see the comparison now the body was already dead 
okay he was dead as good as dead at hundred years he was gone but his faith was still very strong you see now what is going to be to cause you to produce it is not the strength in your body it is not your level of education though his body was dead no qualification no degree no diploma his body could not produce anything for him at that point at hundred years but because his faith was still strong it was going to replace all the qualifications that were missing his faith was strong and having strong faith in a dead body you will notice at the end of that scripture he will start to talk about the resurrection of jesus how jesus even though he was dead but god was able to raise him from the dead yes. having strong faith you are in the middle of a situation which is completely dead there is no life whatsoever but if your faith can be strong in such a situation under such pressure is no longer going to be because of the strength of your physical body no it's going to be because of the strength of your faith hmm considering not he considered not his own body now dead how do you do that tell me talk to me disciples how do you do that when you how how is it how can you do that to stop considering your body and yet what is needed here requires the participation of your body how, how do you do that talk to me now i said it's a kind of faith that is going to be difficult for the next generation to believe how do you ignore your body set aside your qualifications and get to the place that you realize that my academics cannot produce this for me and you consider not your own body or how do you ignore a situation that is present that you can see your children have been sent from school okay you now have some arrears the date is due you're supposed to have paid your rent by now you haven't paid and you know what is going to happen there's no place now you can't you can't start looking for another place again because if you even if you get it they would require a deposit again and some they even say you pay like two months in advance so moving out of where you are now might not be the solution what do you do when you find yourself under such a situation how do you stop considering If your, if your source of income is dead, your business is dead, at your workplace there is no promotion that is coming. The money that you are getting is so little and it's not even, it can't do anything for you. But how do you stop considering that which is dead and focus on what God has said? How do you do that? Because situations like that, they don't want to be ignored. They make a lot of noise. They are there every time. Very bold. Highlighted. You cannot just stop considering. It is there. It's a situation that you can go to sleep. And when you close your eyes, you can see it. When you wake up in the morning, that's the first problem that you see. That is if you are even able to sleep. But how do you stop considering? He considered not his own body. Now dead when he was about a hundred years old neither yet the deadness of sarah's womb <laughs> this is double trouble when all of you are no longer waking now it's not about just yourself all of you are now at home and this is tuesday this is monday this is wednesday afternoon and you know you're supposed to be at work and all of you are sitting at home and you know by sitting no man is ever going to come there's no payment that is going to come just because you were sitting down. No, you know that. You are dead. Your wife is dead. How do you stop considering all that? These are moments now 
when you have to focus on your faith and say okay so if we are not not doing anything in terms of business i think there is another business that we have to start working on and that is developing our faith how do you make your faith to grow under such a situation you need to swallow start swallowing more of the promises of God what did the Lord say my wife come let's sit here we are not going to spend the whole day sleeping let's sit down let's open the Word of God let's find out is there any promise for us you come across scriptures like I was young but now I'm very old and yet I've never seen the righteous being forsaken. Yes. No, his seed begging for bread. Yes. Promises. Those are promises now. What is God saying to you when you find yourself in such a situation? Because under such situations, the voice of God is muted. It's difficult to hear what God is saying. Even if you try to read your Bible, it might sound to be easy now. But to, for the word of God to even make sense. God, what are you saying? What are you saying? What are you saying? During those moments, even if God is going to answer you, you are never going to hear his voice. Why? Because the situation is too loud. So he's not considering his own body that was dead and also the body of the wife, the womb of the wife that was also dead, which means she could no longer conceive. So what God is now promising Abraham is something that he desired some years back. But now he had given up on that request. Okay. And that is now you see God coming and giving Abraham a promise. <laughs> now next verse. And he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. How do people stagger on the promises of God? The answer is there. Unbelief, which is the opposite of faith. If God promises you and you begin to doubt, that is unbelief. That is unbelief. I once read a scripture which shocked me in the book of Hebrews, which says, and because of their unbelief, they could not enter into the promised land because just because of their unbelief though they promised the land listen it's called the promised land a land that was promised but they could not enter into any promise just because of unbelief it was hard for them to believe that god could take them to such a place but before they were given that land, it came in form of a promise. I'm promising you guys, I'm going to take you to a land which flows with milk and honey. And for them to be, though you see them coming out of Egypt, but their level of belief was very low. They doubted God in the wilderness. And because of unbelief, God said, I'm never going to allow you to enter. Hmm. You see the scripture. So we see that they could not enter in because of what? Enter away. Enter away. Okay. So those are two words combined together. It's not just a land. It's a promised land. Okay. It's a land that was promised. So God is still in the business of promising things. Not just lands. And he promises you through dreams and visions and the preaching of the word of God and the reading of the word of God. God is still in the business of promising. Okay. So when God promises you, what stops you from entering into that promise? Hello? What stops you from entering into any promise that God might have given you? Unbelief. So it will appear now as if God is lying to people, busy promising what he cannot deliver. But it's, it's because of their unbelief. 
but the place is still there but they cannot enter because of unbelief he's stuck at not at the promise of god through unbelief but was strong in faith giving glory to god before even receiving it was already glorifying god he was already glorifying god can you do that is it possible can you can you glorify god before having it look at you now how 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 okay anyway but you know it's 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 hard even to make you smile <laughs> can you glorify god and say god i thank you you have heard my cry you have heard my prayer and you start glorifying god before seeing it abraham because of his strong faith he gave glory to God. Glory to God is as a result of strong faith. If your faith is weak, you have to wait until you see it before you can glorify God. There are moments when you just have to worship God. You thank Him for what you can't see. And you say, God, it is all because my eyes are not sharp enough to see you. But from the knowledge that you have given me, I can perceive that you are working out something now. You are busy working out a way out for me now. I can't see you, but I'm convinced through faith that right now you are moving towards this particular situation. I'm going to fight, yes, physically. But it is not because of my arm. You are going to help me to fight this battle. Now you start worshipping God and giving him praise. But everything around you seems to suggest something totally different. And even after saying amen, you still feel like you haven't done anything. But as long as your faith is strong, you have to learn to give glory to God. Verse number 21. And being fully, this is 100%, you see? And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able to also perform. <laughs> ah, disciples, disciples, disciples. Fully persuaded persuaded if you can really persuade yourself right and come to a place which is called fully persuaded and you now believe that god is not only able to promise but is also able to perform that which he promises you believe just by coming across a promise and you know that the man who promised this is able. So unbelief is simply doubting God's ability to perform. Faith is believing in God's ability that he can perform. He can perform. Yeah. He is a God of performance. He, 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 perf he can perform. He is able also to perform. Yeah. But you see, to see Isaac coming, <laughs> it was supposed to be Abraham's performance. I'm not sure whether all of us are married here, but let me just skip that one. But it was supposed to be his performance. But it's no longer believing in his own performance. If God is ever going to perform, <laughs> ha, what is he performing? He is performing a promise. Promises are given, number one, and later on, they are performed. The same person who gives a promise 
believe that he's also able to perform that promise. So he's persuaded. You see, you see him sitting down, drinking coffee, enjoying himself, glorifying God, because he knows that, you know, if this was God who promised, he's not a man that he should lie. Okay? He's not in the business of just moving around and enticing people and giving false promises and, and so on. But this same God, when he moves around promising people through dreams and visions and teachings and so on, there's a moment when he also makes a follow-up of every promise. And he goes on an errand to just perform every promise. So he was persuaded. Especially if you were promised by a being that can never die. It means that promise is never going to die. He's going to perform it. He was able, able there, that's ability. He was able. God is able. Tell yourself, God is able. You see, the ability of God to perform, you have to see it not just on yourself, but on several other things. Just to convince yourself that God is able to do this. There was a time when Jesus said, observe or look at the birds of the air. They don't plant. They don't walk by your principle of sowing and reaping. They just reap. They don't know nothing about sowing. They know everything about harvest. It is trying to move them to another dimension of prosper prosperity. Guys, look at the birds of the air. They don't plant. But when it is time for the harvest, you see them coming. Look at the flowers of the forest. Even Solomon during his time, he was never clothed like any of them. And he said, worry not about what you shall eat, what you shall put on. For God knows all those things. And also because non-believers, those without faith, are looking for those things. So why do you need faith to look for the same things? Believe that God knows, <laughs> the same God who is supplying everything, he's providing for these animals. But look at you now. Why are you worried? So provision, you see it even in the book of Genesis. You know, okay, let me just give you something to just make you believe. It will help to just persuade you. And to bring you to that place where you can fully be persuaded that God is able to perform. Because if you are going to, if you are going to think that everything that God is going to do is going to require your effort, you are lost. And you are lost in such a way that you can never be found. Your effort, in as far as God is concerned, it is not even there. You don't have what is called effort. What is called power. What is called mighty. What is called intelligence. It's never found on you. You don't have it. So I don't want you to have faith in your own expertise. Because there's been a message here, a circulator for years, a good Marano Bazrano's Bazira. And it is also. Sounds good, right? But listen, when the man was raised from the dead, the first man, Adam, when God breathed into him and he rose up. He realized that he was already standing on a solid ground. There were creatures already moving up and down. There was the forest. There was the garden. Rivers were flowing. Diamonds were already available. Gold was all over the place. Which means prosperity went ahead of the person. 
so that you believe that it is not your ability that create wealth i'm resurrecting you now and on the very first day that you wake up you realize that everything that you need is available so what makes you think that without your effort god cannot bless you adam was not the first creature he was not the first creation every other thing was created and adam was created at last but everything was in place just it's a way of trying to break your ego down or your pride down so that you know that god can still do it without your participation he can do it so after you have now been raised from the dead you are now kicking and you're now feeling a bit of energy what makes you think that god cannot again continue doing his own duties and continue performing without your involvement he's a very powerful god let's continue and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to what to what uh-huh next verse and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness imputed to him therefore because he believed that god was able it was imputed the word imputed there it means transferring money into somebody's account okay which means all of a sudden just because of faith believing that god was able it was transferred into his righteousness account in that belief in that faith is being called righteousness he never did any holy act he only believed and he was now called righteous person believing in god's provision this is a provision god is about to provide a son this is provision and believing that god is going to bless you with a material blessing isaac was a material guy he was a physical person and abraham just by believing that his level of righteousness just increased all increased all of a sudden righteousness is righteous righteous not because he hasn't been to any beer hall no but only because he believed in the ability of God. That's righteousness. That's righteousness. Believing that God is able. It was imputed to him for righteousness. Which means it was put into his account. He has got an account. And all of a sudden, just because of that faith, ha, ah, there was a transaction. The balance just increased. There was a deposit. He became more righteous. Not when he stopped beating up his wife. No, nah. though you're not supposed to do that. But the time he believed, that moment when he believed that God is able to do that, his level of righteousness just increased. <laughs> righteousness, it means just right standing before God. He was right standing well presentable before God. Though he was dead, but, but because he believed. He was now qualified to stand before God. Uh -huh, next verse. Now it was not written for his sake alone. Lest you think we are just talking about Abraham. That it was imputed to him. But what? And and the next verse. But for us also. Yeah. So we are not just talking about an old person here, Abraham, who believed in God and so on. The reason why it was written, it wasn't just for his own sake, but for all of us here. To come to that place where you would begin to believe that God can just make up his mind now like he did in the book of Jeremiah. 
He say, I know the plan that I have towards you. A plan to prosper you. It's a prosperity plan. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. <laughs> Which means I'm not, I'm not thinking about hating you now. But uh, the thoughts that I have towards you, I'm thinking of prospering you. And to give you an expected end. Every person is expecting a very good end. And to give you that, that provision, to give you an expected, as long as you are expecting a certain end. But if you are not expecting, then you have a problem. But he's saying, if there is an expectation, you want to have a certain lifestyle, that's expectation. My duty as God is to give it to you. Provide. I know the thoughts, the plan. Now, planning, you see, there is, there is two ways of planning life. Life plan. <laughs> there is a plan that you come up with and God backs you up. And it happens. And there's another plan that God himself sits down and he's planning. And you have to also support him in believing that he is able to bring to pass that plan do you really believe when you come across a scripture that says houses that you have not built no 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 i'm about to close i'm about to close now Listen to me. How difficult it is for people to believe. Houses that you have not built. It's a house. It can be a house before it is built, right? It's a house built by somebody. With the intention of owning it himself. Not having you in mind. And then God is just making a decision one morning and he's saying, I'm giving you that house. Ha! Your plan doesn't cover that. No, I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm saying your plan doesn't cover that side. When we talk about Operation Nehemiah, right? There's a, way that, there's a way that we present it to the rest of the people. But there has to be a way that we present it to the disciples. Okay? You can build. I heard some other people saying, I don't believe in all that. How can I get another house that I never built? I really want my own plan. I want to sit down and really... <laughs> draw i want to i want my own idea i said sir <laughs> the same plan that you have god can give it to somebody uh -huh. and he can build the exact plan just for you to come and then have it you see now you, can i tell you something let me let me show you how how your unbelief is working now Do you know it is easy if i'm to tell pastor that you can own a house that you never bought pastors will say okay there's a possibility because of the nature of the job that we do but members of the church like you you begin to wonder so how can a person just come i'm not a pastor i'm not a prophet so that kind of a promise it appears to be very very difficult eh? it's because you are considering the deadness of your Body. your situation doesn't qualify such a miracle you see now unbelief the people that were given that promise were they bishops no 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 no, no. please let's let's talk 
Those people that you see migrating from Egypt into the promised land, were those were they prophets, were they were they evangelists and so on? And yet to a person like those ones, God is giving you the same promise and saying, houses that you never built, wells that you have never dug. When I do that, it is so that you understand that it was not because of your sword and the strength of your arm, but it was because of the face of the Lord. <laughs> Let me tell you one thing. Let me tell you one thing in conclusion. Let me tell you one thing. If God is going to allow you to work for everything, your heart is going to be deceived. Though you are going to work for something, but I can assure you tonight that there is something that God is never going to allow you to work for. And that thing is the thing that will cause you to praise God and to give a testimony and say, it wasn't because of my ability, because this is beyond my ability. This is beyond my ability. The Bible says, the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strongest. But time and chance happeneth to them all. Time and chance, these two things. And he goes further to say, happeneth, which means time is a happening, it's an event. When time happens on you, <laughs> when it is now time for time to happen I pray for you tonight that this anointing has to come upon you and rest upon you I'm not going to re release you from this place and allow you to go and work for everything you are going to work for this and that, but there is something that God himself is going to work out for you. I pray for the hand of God to begin to perform now. Father, I've served you so well. And I know you're pleased. I'm praying for these people now. That as they go out there, manifest your abilities to perform you know their names you have their phone numbers you know where they are staying you have their addresses you know every need that they have you know their source of income that it is only you <laughs> Father, in the name of Jesus, now as they leave this place, by the grace that you have put upon my life, I'm opening up highways and avenues. In the name of Jesus, there is a force that shall go before you. You shall not push that door. You shall find it already open. Like Peter, when he was moving out of that prison, there was a force that went ahead of him so that he could not say it was because of my intelligence, but it was all because of the hand of God. Somebody is being set free here tonight. You're coming out of that prison. It is not your own work. The grace of God is coming upon you now and setting you free. Father, in the name of Jesus, I bless every disciple now under the sound of my voice. You shall have houses that you never built, properties that you never bought, ah, 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 money that you never worked for. Some of you, you shall have, do you know, do you know, do you know? I've met people that were just called by an individual who had everything in terms of possessions. Talk about aircrafts.
talk about farms, talk about anything, talk about buildings. And somebody just came and said, you know, God has blessed me with every other thing, but he never gave me a son. He never gave me a daughter. But every time when I look at you, I hear the voice of the, I, I've met people like that. And I would want you to come and inherit everything. I'm, t I'm telling you something that I've seen happening. <laughs> Do you know that those people that are out there possessing our promised land, they are possessing it, but it's not a promise to them. God is promising you now. That thing that they have now. And the Bible said that it wasn't our fathers who fought against the Gentiles, the heathens. It was God himself who afflicted them until they left yeah. the place. <laughs> ah, Jesus. Can you imagine that God can start moving from tonight? And start afflicting people for your sake. Ah. Ah. It wasn't our father. We got the notes. We got the information. Our father told us that it was not our hand. That the heathens had to leave the promised land. It was God himself. Causing them to become uncomfortable. And they handed over every well. And every field. You see, some of you from here now understand this. When the children of Israel got into the promised land, remember the spies, they brought back the grapes. Okay? Okay? The mangoes, the apples. Which means they arrived at a time when it was now harvest time. Okay? Your journey. <laughs> You are not, I know we, you, some of us, we believe so much in just sowing, reaping, sowing and reaping, but it's a principle. There is something that we are talking about here now. The children of Israel are arriving when it was now time, not for sowing, but for the harvest. Which means there is somebody who is supposed to have sown on your behalf. We are going to maintain the principle without sowing there is no harvest but who is going to sow okay israel is arriving and it is time for the harvest and they are coming just to grab and to eat and to enjoy what somebody has worked for